Our panel is called Where's the Beef, Your Hamburger in 2050. Um, at first I thought it was your hamburger at $20.50, but the, we'll get there sooner. Um, the, uh, it's a, we're going to talk about the future. We were just talking about uh, plant agriculture. Now we're going to talk about some animal agriculture um, and the consumption of meat on a hotter planet and what it means for us and how it might change and how we might change it. Um, we have uh, with us some terrific people to talk about all the aspects of this. Um, first of all, uh, in no particular order, except the order on my sheet, uh, in the middle here we have uh, Gabor Forgach. Did I pronounce it correctly? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Gabor is the uh, George Vineyard uh, Distinguished Professor of Biological Physics at the University of Missouri, Columbia. By the way, correct me if anything in the bio is wrong. That's happened before. Uh, he is the founder and chief scientific officer at Modern Meadow, uh, a biotech company that applies tissue engineering to the ethical production of animal products. Uh, Gaber's family comes from Hungary, and today is Thursday, so we invited him to talk about food. That pun didn't work at all. Okay. Um, we have also um, at the far end here, Graham Merriweather. Uh, Graham is the director, uh, cinematographer, and producer of the documentary American Meat, uh, which I hope he'll talk to us about today. He's the director of Leave It Better, a video-based social media network where people share ideas on how to green their neighborhoods. Uh, and he's an independent film journalist whose work has been featured by Al Jazeera, Current, PBS, New York Times, and others. Um, and I actually got to talk to Graham a little bit um, uh, at dinner last night. The, uh, I, I was trying to do what I thought was the ethical thing. We had a choice between uh, shrimp and asparagus. I thought I'll go with the, the, the vegetable. I, I had the asparagus. We had, then we had a choice of steak or cod. And I really, really wanted the steak. But I thought I should eat the cod. So I got the cod. And then I was really regretting it because I really, really wanted that steak. And I'm still regretting I didn't get the steak. And then I went over to uh, Graham's table and talked to him. And he told me about all, all the bunnies that get killed by the tractors, much like what Dan Barber was saying, that the, you have blood on your hands. But in this case, it's the animals actually being destroyed by uh, the agriculture. And uh, so I just wanted to say to, to Graham, thanks for making me feel guilty about eating the asparagus. <laughs> uh, and to my immediate left is Dawn Moncrief. She is the founder and executive director of A Well-Fed World, a hunger relief and animal protection organization in Washington. She is the former executive director of the Farm Animal Reform Movement, and she speaks in the United States and internationally on the need for uh, diet change for health, hunger relief, and the environment. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I, was look I looked it up online. A well-fed world uh, is an organization that talks a lot about small incremental steps that each of us can take to achieve a well-fed world, and I was, I was uh, very much inspired by that. Um, because um, last night, uh, Stephen Izell from uh, uh, was uh, one of the folks who is Stephen here today. He uh, st he was uh, sitting, sitting next to me, and he had uh, he had to leave to get home by 8:30, and he had ordered his dessert, and they brought it, and it was just sitting there, and I thought, oh, this is going to go to waste, and something had to be done about that. So, <laughs> Stephen, I stepped up and ate your dessert. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, I just want you to know, Don, that. We are achieving a, a well-fed world, thanks to you, one person at a time. Food waste is a terrible thing. <laughs> so I, I want to start off with Dawn, because her organization works on these issues and talks a lot about the role of meat in the issues that we're talking about. Um, can, you, can you tell us about the role of meat in world hunger? Um, give us an idea of, numerically of the effect of meat and meat, meat production, um, and, uh, and also the role of meat production in climate change, and then how how, how climate change should make us think about the role of meat in, in what we eat and in, in, in agriculture? Well, the top thing anybody can do for climate change, if you're concerned about that, which I hope we are, is reducing your meat consumption and other products. It's, it's a no-brainer. It's common sense, and it needs to be put higher on the agenda for social justice groups, for think tanks, for international institutions and thought leaders. So that's one of the big things that we push for. Meat consumption is predicted to double over 50 years. That was back in 2000. Um, if PRE first came out with it, the UN has then uh, since also said, look, this is a real problem. It's, uh, the growth is stemming from the developing countries, the emerging economies. You've got a very large population base and very high growth rates. And as they eat higher on the food chain, it's very resource intensive. It's straining our limited resources. And this is 
increasingly a problem. Uh, you're going to have more disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And unfortunately, they admit that there's a problem, but it's what are we going to do? Are we going to have more efficient feed, uh, more intensification to clear up land? And just looking for the symptoms, when the most common sense problem solution is to shift away from this massive overconsumption within the high uh, consuming countries, high per capita countries, uh, the US and Europe. And so we need to, to downsize our overconsumption while promoting um, ways and solutions that are not meat centered to get the global increases to reverse. We can't sustain that. And so for climate change, there's so much out there. The UN uh, livestock's a long shadow. You'll hear that quoted all over the place that it's 18% is contributed to livestock. And that's current. Those are current numbers. Actually, they're old numbers now. But that's not even including that livestock is predicted to double over 20, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that is the trend. So the numbers first came out in 2000. And we had 50 billion animals being slaughtered every year for, anim for food, meat consumption. And that is up to 60 billion. We had 6 billion people. Now we're at 7 billion people. So it's a real issue as population increases, the demand for food increases, and our resources become more scarce. So I w I'm interested to see on the video that he's concerned about all the vegetarians. <laughs> 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 um, we're, not, we're not the problem. Um, and uh, you're not just going to see everybody turning vegetarian. Though. So we do work on mass reduction. So we do. Uh, explain, hey, here's great ways that you can be vegetarian, vegan. The more people are willing to do on an individual basis, especially within, we, we focus a lot on American consumption because it's so high. And that gives us a lot of power. That's a lot to decrease. We decrease by half. We've made a major difference. And we also want to focus a lot on um, kind of the, with the growth, there's a lot of focus on the growth. And those countries over there, look at that, they're eating more, they're causing all these problems because now we've got meat consumption expected to double. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with China? What are we going to do with India? And I'd like to f really explain that if you have China eating at two units and they increase to four units, there's all this uproar that, oh my gosh, China has doubled their meat consumption. What are we going to do? And it's an important question. But if you look at US consumption, it's at 10 units. And we've decreased to nine, and we're patting ourselves, oh, look, we're decreasing, we're doing our part, and we're still at nine units compared to their four. It, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. So you can't talk about growth without looking at the starting numbers and what that means. It's critical. We can't look overseas uh, globally and say, what are we going to do about this increases without addressing our own consumption? And uh, it's very convenient. And uh, the other thing that a lot of them talk about is that it's demand driven. And demand is not. A given it's not fixed, it's socially constructed, subsidies affected, public education affected. So it's not something that we're a victim to, this, this demand that's happening. Mm -hmm. We have to reduce it, and there's lots of ways we can do it. And it doesn't negate other solutions. So it's not just, you know, here, this is a, it's not a cure-all, and it doesn't negate other solutions. How far should we go to reduce our meat consumption towards no consumption? How far? We're so far, uh, our numbers are so high up, I mean, to, to talk about that, oh, are we going to try to get no consumption? Well, let's let that be a problem when we get anywhere near close to, to the smaller numbers. So mm -hmm. whatever we can do, we're talking about climate change. Those, the numbers that the UN report talks about, the 18%, which they said is more than all transportation combined, that was at a 100-year time frame. We don't have 100 years to deal with climate change. If you take those numbers and you do it over a 20-year time frame, all of a sudden the livestock contribution doubles and triples because of the methane, because of the nitrous <laughs> oxide. We don't have 100 years. And again, you, don't, you can still work on the carbon dioxide issues. You can still work on fossil fuels. You have to reduce the number of animals that are on the planet. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk about different types of farming mm -hmm. systems. It does, make a it does make a difference. It makes a big difference what type of farming system. And I was glad to see him also, the video, talk about reduction. Mm -hmm. Have to reduce. Graham, reduce the number of animals on the planet. Is that a no-brainer? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I guess, <coughs> I think that there's, 
that Dan Barber was right, that there's absolutely no, there's no doubt that if we were to eliminate animal husbandry in this country, that would, that would, be, a bad, that would be a bad thing. But I completely agree with Don that we have to drastically reduce the amount of meat that, that we consume on a, on a regular basis. Uh, the amount of resources that we have on our planet, and the, especially with the type of meat production that 99% of the meat uh, is being produced with, is very resource intensive and we have, to, we have to decrease the amount of meat that we're eating and we also have to change the systems of, of animal husbandry that we have in place to ones that are more in line with ecological agriculture um, or organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. what, what are, you've talked a lot to farmers and what farmers are doing now. Tell us a little bit from your reporting what, what's going on in agriculture right now and what can we do to promote it um, that's actually changing. Well, as regards to agriculture, I think it's an incredibly exciting time right now in agriculture. Um, you have essentially a, an entire system that is changing. And you have a crisis point. Uh, the average age of the U.S. farmer is going to hit 60 in the next, the next couple of years. And we have less than 2% of our population that's farming. We have more people in jail than we do farming. Um, so you need to have people to grow the food, grow the vegetables, to raise the animals that we all eat. And so, of course, at the same time that we have this raise in the average age of the farmer, you also see this incredible optimism and this incredible movement that's happening in local-based, pasture-based, uh, organic systems around our country. Uh, when I, I've been going around the country and doing screenings of our documentary, the farmers markets in Iowa City are so full that you can barely move. It's like you're at some kind of a rock concert. Uh, you know, the, the farmers markets across this country are absolutely filled. People want to get in touch with their food. People want to get in touch with the source of where things are coming from. Uh, I worked on a, part of the way, the reason I got into the production of this film is I started working on a, a friend of mine's farm, Balsam Farms, which is out on uh, Amagansett, New York, out near East Hampton. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the suburbs, and Ian told me we were going out to harvest potatoes, and I took a pitchfork and, and lifted it up, and I sh shook out the potato plant and realized that I had no idea the potatoes grew <laughs> underground. Um, you know, so I think there's this fundamental disconnect that, hap that has happened for a couple of generations. Our grandparents' generation, they understood, you know, agriculture, it was something, there was a connection to the farm, at least indirectly. My generation, there, there really hasn't, it's just now starting to happen. And so it's an incredibly exciting time to become a farmer. There's a lot of people getting into it. And there's a way that you can actually sell directly to your customers and make a living wage, which is incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. you, give us a clearer idea of what, what specific technologies are changing the way that farmers do what they do and the role of generational change. I mean, are young, younger people who are going into farming bringing new ideas with them? Sure. Uh, and I can only speak to, to animal husbandry mm -hmm. as far as the, the latest technologies. Uh, one thing that is often said and it's, it's, a, it's a mistake when it's said, is that ecological agriculture is a return to our, is a return to an age-old agriculture, thousands of years old. Not the case. Um, it's actually using very cutting-edge technologies uh, and doing, using the natural resources that we have in place. For instance, Joel Salatin, who's one of the main characters in our documentary, who's also in Food, Inc., and is one of the main characters in the book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. He uses a model which uh, they use electric fencing. And so they, they are intensely rotationally grazing their cattle so that they get the most use from the land that they have. And, it, and it's really fascinating. I mean, you have, he basically has taken natural models. So uh, the fact that in the Serengetis you have birds that follow the, uh, the wildebeests. And so what, hap what, what happens naturally in, in nature is that you have these large herbivores and they create manure and then these birds will follow behind and eat the insects and the beetle grubs out of the manure and it's a great protein source. So 
Joel looked at that system, and other farmers looked at that system, and they said, well, how can we do, replicate that? And so they're using technology uh, to basically put in electric fences, have these cows move, and then Joel decided to take the, take the chickens out of the chicken coop, move the chicken coop up on the tractor, and then he calls it the eggmobile. He follows the eggmobile behind the cows one day after the cows, and the chickens peck and eat the beetle grubs and the larvae and spread the manure around. So it's incredibly uh, ecologically friendly. The eggs have the most uh, nutrition of any eggs in the country. Uh, and the chefs in, in the Washington area and um, Northern Virginia, he, he, can't, he can't sell all the eggs he pr he's producing. So there's all this, it's very innovative, it's very exciting, there's a lot of technology. And we're, we're actually using ecological agriculture to make, his acres are more productive than any other acre in Augusta County where his farm is. Before I get to Gabor, who's got a great story to tell, I want to just come back to Don on one question here. Electric fencing, stuff like I mean, are you, are you cool with things that are going to, be, going to be more ecologically sound and are going to increase production? Uh, at, but but for, for, for animals, is that okay to do that to them? Well, it's certainly better than keeping them crammed in cages. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the points, again, on the video, I'd love to just sit there and tag that little video apart. Um, but, uh, oh, we won't have any cows if there are too many vegetarians. Um, they're so sentimental. If you want cows, you can keep them in a sanctuary style. There's lots of ways to get their fertilizer. Uh, I love the, the chicken idea with the eggs. Uh, we'd be fine with it as an animal protection organization if you didn't slaughter the chickens afterwards. Let them do their thing and take their eggs and, you know, but it's, it's a slaughter industry just like the rest. So the animal protection side of what we do we prefer animals not to be slaughtered. It's pretty much that simple. But that's not going to happen. We're not so idealistic. We don't have our heads in the cloud. Uh, we're very common sense oriented. So, you know, please have chickens following around and doing what they do. Uh, mm -hmm. Use animals for fertilizer. But again, you don't have to, A, you don't need animals for fertilizer. You can compost. There's lots of other ways. I'm not going to get into it. We have information on our website. But they do provide a sense, uh, a, a source of fertilizer be great if you had them and then slaughter them. But uh, so the, the economies, right. you know, they can't just keep them going. So there, it that's sounds why. like there's a lot of agreement here on incremental steps that will take us in, in a common direction. And, and can I just say also sure. that if we get the massive reduction, it takes the pressure off the system. It'll allow these systems much more room. They don't have to compete with the factory farms. Most of the people who are eating meat are eating factory farm meat. And if you're into um, getting the more humane, the local meat, uh, there's environmental, you know, again, niches that we can talk about uh, that are around that, but then do that. Do that in your home, but when you eat out at a restaurant, you're eating factory farm meat. So go vegetarian, go vegan in those locations um, and keep the, the meat and animal products that you do have control over. And uh, that, that helps these farmers. It helps us to get less meat, fewer animals, mm -hmm. and um, it also helps get them out of the factory farming system. So there is a lot of overlap where we can we can work together. Okay, let me, now let me bring in Gabor because, Gabor, let me ask you this question, and it's a rhetorical question, obviously. Is there, an alter, is there a more ambitious alternative than the, I mean, the, I think there's agreement on the incremental steps. Is there a way that we can get meat without exhausting the Earth's resources? Yes. Tell us about your role in that, what you've been doing. So what about getting to food or getting to meat, just having one cow in the whole universe, um, not using any land, practically, to graze them, not slaughtering even that one cow, would that be acceptable? I love it. Do it. Good. <laughs> so I am a scientist, so I, 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 can, I, can, I can come up with ideas that uh, when, when others come out and say, yeah, you are cuckoo. And we're all cuckoos as scientists, so I don't have bad conscience doing that. So uh, I'm coming from the world of tissue engineering. And tissue engineering is a science that um, primarily was devised and, and uh, set up to deal with regenerative medicine, to, to, to build tissues using doctors, physicists, engineers together uh, to, to remedy problems that we're facing, uh, to replace uh, injured tissues, dysfunctional tissues, and eventually uh, creating new organs. 
or replacement organs. So tissue engineering, if you go to Google and, and read anything about it, is in the realm of tissue engineering, in, in, the, in the realm of uh, regenerative medicine. And we founded a company three years ago. The name is Organovo. By now, it's public. And it's using a proprietary tissue engineering technology, namely printing tissues, that allows to construct three-dimensional functional tissues that eventually can be implanted into humans. So we started thinking, OK, so we can basically create any biological, viable biological structure. But we couldn't move out of uh, the realm of regenerative medicine, because that's where tissue engineering was. We were stuck in it. And then one day, the Eureka moment, moment came and said, well, why don't we try to build food? After all, meat is, is made of, of, of mammalian cells. And we know how to package them, how to deposit them, how to make them interact in the right way uh, to get functional tissues. And if we can do that, uh, at, at the level of regenerative medicine needs, well, why wouldn't we be able to do that uh, at the level of agriculture? So to make the long story short, we started making meat products or animal products. So we're focusing on making leather and meat at this time without killing anybody, um, uh, without, without using the resources that, that you guys are all talking about. Uh, it, just from a simply scientific point of view, it makes no sense to me. When I look at uh, numbers like one kilogram, to increase the weight of a chick by one kilogram, of a, of a pig, of a cow, respectively, you use two kilograms, four kilograms, and eight kilograms of feed. Well, that's nonsensical. If that's what, 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 it, what it needs, I have no idea because I'm, I'm new to this field, but if that's what, what is needed, for me to eat meat, well, that's ridiculous. So there has to be a better way. So we are printing meat. And, and when I say we're printing meat or leather, I have, to, I have to make those statements a little bit more accurate. And we're talking about it with Willie last night. The, the product that we're making should be considered as flour. Flour is something that you wouldn't need just the flour that you get in the supermarket because it's yucky. So what do you make out of flour? You make bread, you make cookies, you make uh, pancakes, you make bazillion things. And so this new biomaterial, you want to call it meat? Fine. I want to call it something that is a source of animal proteins, which whether you like it or not, whether you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you will need it. If you don't eat animal proteins, you're going to be in deep trouble. So this is a biomaterial, although when you say biomaterial that is consumable by, by, by eating it, I know that it doesn't sound right. Uh, we're still looking for a right word. It is something that contains all those nutrients that you would, you would get when you eat your hamburger, actually less of those nutrients. Uh, and, and so that's where we're going. We are using, we, we, we would like to present this material as a new biomaterial that is the basis for any kind of meat products that you may want to build. So we go to chefs and they love it because what would, a chef would like to work with some base material and then make fantastic things out of it. And so we provide that base material just the same way as, as the baker, the patisserie chef, takes flour and makes wonderful things out of it. So that's the way we should look at this, at this product. But it, in every sense uh, of, of, of meat, it is meat. Now, I, I've been reading about what you, people used to call lab meat. I like biomaterial much better, although I don't think you can put it on the package, right? <laughs> so I've been reading about this for a long time, and it keeps not happening. Are we really anywhere close to this? Or, I mean, how far off are we from being able to do this? Well, any uh, transformative idea such as printing organs or, or printing meat, there's immediately a lot of hype around it. And, and the problem is that there has been a lot of hype around it. Although I have to say that it was Churchill in 1933 who said, I'm looking at this chicken breast. I mean, it's ridiculous. He says, I don't think that we need to kill animals for that. There has to be a better way of making it. And I can envisage that in 50 years, it will be produced 
by researchers, by in, in the labs. Oh, you don't want to hear that. But, uh, but the point is that he already thought of it. In 1959, a Dutch food expert, I'm not even sure that he was a food expert, but he started thinking about it. And in 1999 was the first uh, year that, that a patent around cultured meat was granted. And so since that time, there is a, there's a big uh, revival of this, uh, of this idea. And it is the Dutch who started it. And, uh, but the hype remains. And so uh, even though I'm talking to you, I, I, I am doing it with, with some trepidation. I, I don't really think that we are at the point where I would like to make a big fuss of it. And it's good if there are others who, who carry the hype. But, uh, but, but the approach that we are trying to follow is a fundamentally different approach from everything that has been done before. And as you know, I ate a piece of that meat that we produced. And I'm still here. I'm still alive. Uh, so, so I think the hype eventually, hopefully, will, will disappear. And, and the best reassurance I think I can give at this point is that if we could make regenerative medicine grade tissues that have been implanted into living organisms and healed the living organism, why wouldn't be able we to make kind of this material for consumption? Mm -hmm. let, let, let me ask you guys a little bit about, to the extent that we can take animals out of the equation, uh, it sounds like there's general agreement about a lot of good things, methane and so forth, that will be changed <coughs> as a result of that and uh, being able to feed the world more easily. What are, let me ask, come, come to Grant, what are, are some of the downstream consequences we need to think about that are going to complicate this, how it's going to affect agriculture? For example, Dawn brought up fertilizer. That she, said, she said, I believe that there's no need for animals, for animal fertilizer. And, there and there are other, I mean, other ways. That, do you agree with that? Well, there, yeah, I mean, there's something called synthetic fertilizer, uh, which, as Dan Barber mentioned in the video, is made up of uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. Um, the thing is that uh, potassium, basically the process of, uh, of fixing that and, and making it into something usable, turning it into ammonia, uh, is one that uses entirely non-renewable resources. So the phosphorus and the potassium are mined uh, often in uh, mines like at the Dead Sea, and there's a finite amount of that uh, resource. Um, the nitrogen to get uh, converted into ammonia is largely natural gas and coal that is mostly natural gas that is used to do that. Now, if we were to remove animal manure from the equation, you would suddenly massively ramp up the need for uh, potassium, phosphorus, and natural gas and coal, seeing as how that production is actually a, a huge amount of the, it's a, a many percentages of the, of the, uh, of the Earth's, uh, of what we convert to energy. So, Manure, as it turns out, is a renewable resource. Uh, and so you're always going to need to have animals in agriculture so that you can grow vegetables and do so in a, in a way that isn't dependent upon uh, fossil fuels. Now, I agree that we need to massively reduce the amount of, of meat that we consume, and we need to change our agriculture to be one that is more in balance with our ecological boundaries. Um, one thing I'd like to add, though, is that, you know, as I hear about uh, developing meat in a test tube, something doesn't feel right. And I guess what I would say is, um, you know, on that farm, on my friend Ian's farm, Balsam Farms, out in Amagansett, you know, I was sort of, it was, a, like I said, you can imagine if you have the first time you realize potato comes from out of the ground, it's kind of like a, whoa, you know, there's a, there's a lot that happens there. Um, and another thing that happened there was I realized how much death is involved in agriculture. I mean, they grow cantaloupes, and the crows were going crazy on, on the cantaloupes that year, and they had to kill a bunch of crows. Uh, you know, the, the tractor that harvested those potatoes, the combines, there's mice, there's birds that get caught up in that. And I think as our culture has gotten more and more removed from the cities, we've gotten so removed from the natural cycles of life and death that are necessary for our existence. And so once you get into this idea, well, we can suddenly manufacture uh, food 
the things that sustain us, that becomes uh, problematic. There was something that happened uh, with the cattle industry where they said, scientifically, we can take dead cows, this ground up, we can feed it back to cows because it'll be actually a really good um, revenue. You know, we, we, we'll save money. And then they brought the, Joel told me the story, they brought him out to Ponderosa Steakhouse. They're like, this is the future. And Joel was like, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna eat, I, I'm not gonna start feeding dead cows back to cows. And the reason you don't do that is because cows are herbivores. And over millennia, more than millennia, they've been developing their rumen and, and they've been changing and, and they, they're supposed to eat grass. So what happened as a result of feeding dead cows to cows, as I'm sure many of you know, is mad cow disease. We had, we had the development of prions. And so when you jump into things without understanding the ramifications of them morally, because you want to see if you can do it, suddenly you may enter very dangerous territory. Gabor, do you want to respond to that? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, it's not meat in a test tube. I think th that, that idea really should be taken off because it's, I, I don't, I don't want to give a scientific lecture on this, but it, it is so far from reality, what you just said, that it, it's meat in the test tube. Sure, we, we know that babies in the test tube, but that's just the very wrong approach, number one. Now, number two, uh, and, and this is really the bad news, I think. Uh, we, we're talking about reducing the number of animals, consuming less meat. I think it's wishful thinking. It's just not going to happen uh, when, when, when there are, when there will be 90 billion people in about 30 years, whatever we, we teach, it's, it's, it's all very noble, but, it, but it, it's not going to penetrate the masses in, in, in China where meat consumption is just exponentially growing. Um, even in India, uh, the Hindus don't eat beef, but the reason they don't eat beef is not because they don't like it. It's because of religious reasons. When they go outside of India, they do eat. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, so I think we have to approach the, the whole issue, in my opinion, differently. It's, it's very nice that we're talking about reducing the number of animals and teaching people to eat more vegetable. And, and I'm sure that, that that resonates with many people. But I don't think it's a winning proposition. So my, I, what I advocate is that of course, I'm advocating my own art. Uh, but that is going to respond to many of your, of your wishes. And also many of your wishes, even though you don't like the, the smell of a test tube. And there is no test tube. <laughs> so if, if what, what, no, is the vessel? what is the vessel? Is a pot. How about, so how like about a, a pot? A petri dish? Or? Well, you can call it a petri dish. I would call it a big pot uh, <laughs> that, that can handle cells. And when you, when you cook your meat, your meat is a bunch of cells. So you use a pot. You don't, you don't say it's a Petri dish, but, but what's the difference? On, on the, the, <laughs> it uh, is a Petri dish. The, I think the Europeans, we were calling it vat meat, but I think vat developed some bad connotations <laughs> because of the value added tax over in, in, in Europe. So let, let me, I, I want to bring in some questions here. We have a few minutes for that. I, I'm going to put one thing on the table, and any of the uh, panelists can address it if they wish to as we're going through the questions. And that is, the last panel, we were talking a lot about genetic modification to adapt to climate change, right? We were talking about genetically modifying plants. What about genetic modification of animals to adapt to climate change? But let me, let's bring in some questions. This woman over here had a question first. Sorry, right back next to the camera. Yeah, Marsha Johnston, Earth Steward Associates. I Actually, can we, get, can we just get like three people to ask questions in a row? Please do it quickly, and then the panelists sure. can choose what to answer. Question for uh, Gabor. Um, was it good? That's the first question. Tasty, you know, all that kind of stuff. Can you be a little more specific about what it looks like? Do you make it in the shape of an animal? I mean, I, I don't know. Just like, is it a blot? What does it look like? Okay. Let's get a couple more people in and then. Uh, in the same vein, what are the raw materials that you guys are using and what are the byproducts? Because you use, it seems to kind of stress much bigger efficiency, you know, rather than eight pounds per one pound of meat, you get one to one, but what's your raw material? What, so what's, if you can tell us okay. more about it. And there's a gentleman, uh, yeah, right there. Um, a constitutional law expert at Harvard recently said that he would eat his hat if the health care reform uh, movement was actually uh, reduced in the Supreme Court. 
So I'm wondering if you could make hats that were ed edible if you're making leather. Uh, secondly, if we have um, 9.2 uh, billion human animals on the planet, why can't we use the fertilizer from the humans that are just now going into uh, the environment? Okay. Uh, anyone who wants, let's start with Dawn and proceed across. Any questions you want to ask? Well, we could use human uh, and other animal manure, f and some, some areas do, and it's quite successful. And again, also composting of the other vegetables and uh, plant-based materials provide great fertilizer. There is a whole agricultural sector that does this. It's called veganic, so you can look that up or talk to me, and that provides the science behind it. Cover. Well, I have two specific questions. Uh, first, uh, how did it taste? Neutral. Uh, it was, uh, I, 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 when I did it at the TED Med, I put some salt and pepper just to make things a little bit more exciting, but, uh, but it was neutral. It was, it was that base material, essentially, that I was talking about. It is something that, that I should give that a meat patisserie, patisserie and, and let him do something. But it has all the nutritional value of, of the meat. So uh, it was neutral. It was not bad. I just said, it's not bad. And it, it really wasn't bad. Uh, but it was not like your juicy hamburger. Now, what is the, what is the raw material? So I said, uh, what about if we have just one cow? So the mascot cow. So I go into the cow. I make a biopsy, just the same thing that we do in the, in the regenerative medicine space. And I grow up that, those cells under very controlled conditions, uh, totally um, totally contro controlled conditions. And when I have enough, uh, I, um, well, not I, we uh, shape it. So there is a lot of biology going in there, which I can tell you more about it if you sign the NDA. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the point is that we can shape it. And that's back to your question. Uh, if you like uh, the, the round shape of a hamburger, think about it. We can do that too. But we can do anything. Anything, not the waste. I mean, those are very, very important questions. Cells produce waste. Whatever culture medium you use, uh, and, and there are cells, you have to get rid of the waste. And there is no, there is, there is, there is no panacea for that. That is, 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 is uh, gotten rid of the same way as you do it when you do any kind of cell culture. So, but the raw material are cells, animal cells. And not stem cells. What do you feed them to grow? Culture medium. Culture medium, a standard yeah, culture, culture medium. medium. Culture medium is basically, wa basically water. And there is, today, there are plant-based culture media. So it's, it's again, it's not, uh, people ask, oh, culture medium. So those people who, who know something about cell culture say, oh, you, do you have FBS in it? FBS is for uh, uh, fetal bovine serum. Uh, for that, of course, you have to kill animals. No, we, we don't use that. We use plant-based plant uh, growth media. So you're still feeding plants to animals? Uh, animal cells. Right. Yes. Animal cells. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't think there was any questions you, in there that I need to address. address. Any of those. Okay, let's get, we have a few more questions. We have a gentleman here and back there, the guy in the front. Thank you. Uh, Hans Heron. I think, you know, you can do anything. I mean, we can make bombs. But should we do it? If we just can do it, you know. But so there's limits sometimes. We, we know we can do a lot of things. Question is, uh, do we need to? Now, on, on this uh, meat issue, first of all, the statistics. People think that it will grow forever. It cannot because price will increase and people don't have the money. So eventually, if you true price the meat, for example, meat products, they will become more expensive so a few people again could afford them. I mean, there is a feedback there which people and IFPRI and others actually do not factor in their uh, models and uh, long-term calculation. That's one. Okay. So I think that's, but what I wanted to ask you, so once we, let's say we, we go and we print our, our uh, uh, sit on a computer, we can print our uh, dish, Right, because we three D printing, so we have like ten containers in that printer. So there is flour there, there's some vitamins, there may be some other things. They've been put onto this plate there, three D. Put them in the oven. Actually, the whole thing is the oven too. Now, what is the landscape which produces this? So we got to have a world where there's only corn and oil palms, which produce the base products for this. Is that then sustainable? 
you know, I mean, one has to look at the consequences, the okay. long term, okay, much so more when we start to do something. So I wonder, okay. you know, what, what do you think about okay, the consequences? Okay, the downstream consequences of changing that. We have a question back here. Well, one thing I think is clear from the discussion today is that there are not now ready substitutes for meat, so it's hard to persuade people uh, not to eat meat. Uh, for industrial products that are even more of a threat to food, industrial use of food is much more or considerably more of a threat than, um, than animal uh, you know, con consumption of meat. Uh, and it'd be quite easy to, they're ready substitutes, people prefer the substitutes, quite easy to, to persuade people to make that switch away from y uses of food for industrial products. So is this just, my question is, is this, is this a good strategy? Okay, and I think we had one more question over here. Tim, oh, okay. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, you know, all the uh, panelists agreed that we need to reduce our meat consumption. And like the author of Eating Animals argues that it's much easier to be a vegan or a vegetarian than to be a selective omnivore since like around 99% of all the meat in this country is a uh, factory farmed. And I just wanted to know um, for Graham, do you agree that being a vegan or vegetarian is easier than being a selective omnivore? And if not, what kind of parameters should we put around eating meat. Okay, and let's start with Graham and move across, and we yeah, just have a couple I, of minutes to. I don't agree that being a vegan or vegetarian is easier than being a, an, an omnivore who eats meat that you know the source of. And that's, over the course of the film, my diet changed from being one that pretty much ate anything to somebody who only, I only eat meat if I know the farm that it came from. Uh, because I did film on the conventional hog farms and chicken farms, and that was also a transformative experience. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, it, you know, it's something that at first it seems like a bit of a pain because you, you go into a restaurant and like last night we had dinner at Nora. Uh, the first thing I did was ask the guy that came around was, so do you guys source your meat locally? And they said, yes, we source locally. It's grass finished. And so I ordered the sirloin. Now, you know, if there are a lot of, there are a lot of easy uh, solutions. Uh, there's websites where you can go, uh, local harvest real-time farms uh, where you can find out sources of, of grass-fed meats. Uh, there's also this incredible farmer's market, uh, CSAs. There's this there's movement that's happening. And it's very easy to get access to these things. But you do have to do a little bit of groundwork. Um, so I will now let other people talk. Well, to, to your question, first of all, uh, if, if, uh, if you go up, again, the bakery store uh, shop, uh, that, that stuff that you eat there, beautiful croissant or something like that, it, it has gone through so much chemistry already that it's mind-boggling. And we still don't have any problem with that. So I, I claim that it is going to be the same with, with, with our product. Now, you raised the question, uh, which, which, is a, uh, which is a very delicate one. You said, should we make this type of leather or meat just because we can? And in science, uh, this question has a no-brainer response. Yes, because if, if you can do it, even if I say, no, 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 I'm not going to do it, somebody will. So it's coming whether you like it or not. And, and so to that question, this is a very simple answer. Uh, there was a gentleman who uh, I think you, you asked, uh, is our strategy the right one? I cannot agree with you more. I, I, I don't think, and then I... I, um, yeah, I'm going to stop. Uh, <laughs> okay, Dawn, you get the last word. Oh, great. I like the last word. Okay. So uh, these are all, they work together. We get caught up in the theory of, well, what about this? And it's no, no animals, no meat. Uh, but it's not just going to happen. We are working together. This is in time right now. It's happening, but it's happening at a very small scale. People are eating less meat, vegetarian, vegan, uh, especially with the, within the higher income countries uh, because we understand the, the diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and what we can do about it, the environmental consequences. I have information on local versus less. For environmental reasons, we can talk about less meat, no meat versus the, the mixed systems. And uh, in some areas we win, in some areas not so much. And I'm a huge fan of, of this, 
this technology. It's going to take a while. It's not going to be immediately available. It's not going to be available at the lower uh, income levels, and that's country levels, sectors within the U.S. So there's a lot of politics around that. And when you're talking about what the industrial uh, uses, when the meat crisis hit with the, bio, the biofuels, nothing, a drop in the bucket compared to the inefficiencies of what we are using to create meat. It's uh, wildly inefficient, and we are bidding the crops away from the poorest of the poor. The Ethiopia, during the famine, exporting food for meat for the higher income countries, and this is common practice. It's still happening today in the poorest of the poor countries. So there are real benefits. It's not some kind of idealistic, oh, if we ate less meat, there'd be more for the poor. It's, we're bidding it away. That, their food's already over there. We don't need to eat less here and transport it over there. We need to stop taking their basic food supplies, making feed to make the animals that we are eating. So as Americans, we have a great responsibility to, to take that on and eat, eat less meat. Cheese, I've got stuff on cheese. Cheese, very resource intensive. See me, I've got all kinds of research as well as online at awfw.org. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for this wonderful panel? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.